Hi, I'm Mike Beanland, Chief Trainer with Perth Boat School. To get your skipper's ticket, you need to study this, the entire skipper's ticket workbook. A copy of this book is on the skipper's ticket DVD that you're looking at, as a PDF file, so you can read it on your computer. Once you've studied this workbook, watch the rest of this video. It's a summary of some of the most important parts of the workbook. You can then book your appointment with a Perth Boat School trainer and do your skipper's ticket on any day you want at any boat ramp you want. It's that easy. Just book it online. When you book online, you'll also be sent a link to the practice theory quiz. And if you can pass that, you're sure to pass the real theory test on the day. You can do your theory and practical one after the other at the boat ramp or on the boat. If you study your theory from the workbook and this video, it should only take you about 15 minutes to pass the multiple choice questions and you can then walk over to the boat and do the practical. Now driving a boat with the proper training is easy. Our trainers will show you easy ways of remembering what to do and how to do it. There are just 11 tasks that the department requires you to do. The trainer will demonstrate each and every one of them, then you get to practice until you're getting it right, then you're assessed. It's more of a safety competence test than a boat handling test, so don't worry. It's more like getting L plates for a boat. You get issued with one of these on the spot once you pass the practical and you can immediately go out on your boat and skipper it. You're a skipper. Everything in this video you must know however, everything. Watch this video a few times and make sure you do know everything. First, this is what you need to know about the skipper and the skipper's ticket. The skipper is the person responsible for the safety of the boat, the crew and the passengers. The skipper doesn't need to actually be the driver. Somebody else could drive, so long as there is a qualified skipper who is responsible on board. So remember, the skipper is responsible for everything. Under 10 year olds can't drive a boat. On a boat with a motor 6 horsepower or less, the skipper doesn't need a skipper's ticket. A boat with a motor above 6 horsepower is a skipper's ticket boat. It must have a skipper with a skipper's ticket. So remember, you can drive a boat without a skipper's ticket if the motor is under 6 horsepower. A person over the age of 10 can drive and skipper a boat without a skipper's ticket if the boat is under 6 horsepower. Only a person over the age of 14 is allowed to skipper a skipper's ticket boat. That's one over 6 horsepower. Now, there are some restrictions on a skipper between 14 and 16 years old. They are restricted to skippering during the day and they must stay under 8 knots. Once you get to 16 years of age, there's no need to do anything. The restriction just doesn't apply anymore. Boat wake and noise out in the open ocean isn't a big problem, but in a confined area, it is a problem. Boat wake and noise caused by speed can do more than just harass and annoy other people. Wake and wash can cause damage to people, boats and pens, the riverbank, and even wildlife. Yeah, even wildlife. Wildlife is swans and ducks, ducklings, duck nests, eggs and so on. Even dolphins are wildlife and they get hit by boats. So, there are particular places we must stay under 8 knots. 8 knots is a common speed for you to remember. You must stay under 8 knots within 15 metres of another moving boat. You must stay under 8 knots within 50 metres of a jetty, a wharf, a person in the water, a moored vessel, riverbank or low water mark. So, that's under 8 knots inside 15 metres from another moving boat and stay under 8 knots within 50 metres of a jetty, wharf, moored vessel, a person in the water, riverbank or low water mark. Know these numbers. 8 knots, 15 metres, boats. 8 knots, 50 metres, other things. Also, the maximum speed when the water is less than 3 metres deep is 8 knots. When in doubt, stay under 8 knots. And remember, we go slow for many reasons, including wildlife. There's also a rule that says that you must travel at a speed that will give you time to maneuver to avoid a collision. So no matter what somebody else does, you must always be able to avoid a collision. So 8 knots within 15 meters of another moving boat, 50 meters from other things is a good guide to allow you time to safely stop. And you should also slow down to keep your vessels washed to a minimum when passing near boats in pens, boats on moorings, ducks and swans nests, dolphins, etc. Learn these. They are important numbers you need to know. 
Now, let's look at where you can or can't do certain things. A channel, a fairway and a passage are all the same thing. They are like roads in the water. They are used to drive from one place to another. They are for navigation. So you can't anchor, you can't put down crab nets, you can't put cray pots, you can't put buoys or markers in a channel, a fairway or a passage. Many people get confused. A channel, a fairway and a passage, same thing. So you can't do anything other than travel in them. You also can't tie up to any navigation markers and you definitely can't tie up to somebody else's mooring. In a mooring control area, only one boat can go on one mooring at one time. No matter how big the mooring seems to be or how small the boats are. One mooring, one boat at one time in a mooring control area. Now, these mooring control areas are in places like Roto and the Swan River. If you don't have a mooring, you can anchor. And anchoring should always be done in sand if possible. Try to avoid anchoring on a reef and on seagrass beds. You may think that your one anchor won't do any damage if you drop it once on a reef. But a thousand people a year, dropping and dragging and lifting their anchor in a small area will do a lot of damage. There's a lot of anchors bashing the reef and ripping up the seagrass over and over and over. And of course the most damage occurs on the best spots, don't they? Because they are the best spots. So let's all anchor in clear sand, remember that. It's also a law that your boat needs to be registered if it has a motor, or even a bracket or a fitting for one. Your boat does not need to be registered if it doesn't have a motor or a fitting for a motor. So a canoe, for example, doesn't need to be registered. Yachts that are not powered by a motor do not need to be registered if, if they have no bracket for a motor. But if a yacht has a bracket designed for holding a motor, then it must be registered. Motor or motor bracket equals registration. Even if there's no motor on it at the time, it must be registered. All boats must have their registration numbers on the boat. And when you get your sticker, remember this, put the registration sticker on the port side adjacent to, close to, the registration number. Cars don't have radio stickers anymore, but boats still do. Cars used to be on the left-hand side of the window, boats the same. Not on the front window, but on the side of the boat next to the registration number. A tender does not need to be registered. For those that don't know, a tender is a small boat used to take people from a larger boat to the shore. And back again. They're just small boats. They must be less than 3.1 meters and the motor must be 5 horsepower or less. Tenders must have the parent's vessel's registration number on each side of the tender vessel. There are many ways of signalling distress, including waving, a flare and a continuous sound signal from a foghorn. If you know that someone is in distress, you have to assist them, unless of course someone else is already helping them, or it's too dangerous for you to do so, or for example, if you can hear them on the radio and they're too far away for you to help them. But you don't have to tow anyone else's boat. You just have to rescue people, not their boats. Speaking of incidents and accidents, you don't need to report all accidents. Can you imagine telling the Department of Transport every single time someone scratched your boat? You only need to report to the department when there is an accident resulting in serious injury or death or if the boat is so damaged that it's unsafe. Water skiing has a bunch of rules. Some are obvious and common sense, but the ones you need to remember for the skipper's ticket are the numbers. Learn all the numbers. Let's go over some of the numbers again. You can only drive a boat if you're over 10. You can skipper a boat if you're over 14, with restrictions, and at 16 the restrictions are lifted. Driving a ski boat, towing a skier is different to just driving a boat. You can only tow a skier if you're over 17 and have a skipper's ticket. And when skiing, you must have an observer over 14 looking backwards watching the skier. The driver does not watch the skier. The observer must keep a watch on the water skier and report information to the boat driver. Also, a skier landing has right of way over a skier departing the beach, which makes sense because the skier headed to the shore can't just stop out in the water to avoid the skier that's leaving the beach. It makes more sense for the skier that is about to leave the beach 
to wait for the arriving seer to have landed on the beach, the water is clear, and then you leave the beach. The 50 meter rule still applies to skiers, so if you're towing a water skier, you must be at least 50 meters behind another skier. Every person on a jet ski, which is often called a PWC, which stands for personal watercraft, must wear a life jacket. Life jackets can be called PFDs or life jackets. That is a personal flotation device. When you're freestyling or wake jumping, you must stay more than 30 meters away from another jet ski. You also need to stay at least 50 meters away from a boat or a person. So that's 30 meters from a jet ski or 50 meters from a boat or a person. Because a jet ski is under 3.75 meters long, they can't go further than five nautical miles from shore. No boats under 3.75 meters long can go further than five miles from the shore. Remember this, it's another of the numbers that you must know. Under 3.75 meters can't go offshore. You'll hear this five nautical mile number mentioned a number of times and the words onshore and offshore. This is recreational. For those of you with commercial licenses, remember onshore and offshore used for the skipper's ticket is different to the onshore and offshore commercial definitions, which we won't go into here. For you, recreational boat user, five nautical miles off the shore, off the mainland, is important. If you stand on the beach, you can see a small boat up to about five nautical miles from the beach. The curvature of the earth means that further offshore you can't see a person. So if you stand on a small boat five nautical miles from the shore, you should be able to see the shore, which means you can navigate back to it. You can also signal to somebody on the shore if needed. So from the beach, the shore, to the horizon on the sea is about five miles. We call that onshore, the closest section to the shore. As I said, beyond that, the curvature of the earth means no one on the shore can see you. So we'll call that area offshore. We'll talk more about this later on. For now, just remember, 3.75 meter long boats and under must stay inside five nautical miles. Remember, everyone on a PWC must always wear a PDF. Always, 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 everywhere. And it needs to be type 50 or 50 SAS. Then further than 400 meters from the shore in unprotected waters, up until you reach two nautical miles, you need to have type 100 or 150 life jacket for each person on board, plus inshore flares. So in summary, in protected waters or within 400 meters of the beach in unprotected waters, type 50 jacket. In unprotected waters further than 400 meters from the shore, you need a Type 100 plus inshore flares on a jet ski. A boat, however, is different. The moment you take a boat into unprotected waters, you need a level 100 or higher life jacket for each person on board. If you are getting a bit confused about what life jackets are, remember this. A Type 1 has a neck collar and will rotate you to face upwards. Type 2 and 3 are similar buoyancy but don't have the collars. Also, Remember that in addition to the usual 50 meters away, eight knot rule for all boats, jet skis have more rules. You can't do freestyling and wake jumping on a jet ski closer than 30 meters from another jet ski and 50 meters from another vessel or person in the water. There are lots of rules and zones covering what you can or can't do. I'll go over the most important ones now. Most important, no dumping of any plastic is allowed anywhere. Fuel and oil also not allowed in the water. Sewage is also another source of pollution in the water. There are three sewage zones, zone one, zone two, and zone three. And you can read more about them in the workbook. But the one to remember is zone one, the most important, the most sensitive area. No sewage discharge is allowed in zone one at all, whether it's treated or untreated. Other zones do allow different types of treatment of sewage. Zone 1 is areas such as marinas, yacht clubs, boat harbours, ports and maritime facilities. It's pretty obvious really. People don't want sewage in a marina or a yacht club or somewhere where you're going to swim. So remember this, no plastic, no sewage of any sort in Zone 1, which is where we swim. And lastly, let's look at fuel, which is another sort of pollution when fuel gets spilled. 
When re refueling your boat, you need to do a few things. Four main things, actually. Guard against overfilling by knowing how much fuel you need to add to your tank. Don't wait till, the spill, <laughs> till it spills out the top. Listen carefully for blowback from the tank. That's the noise you hear when it's almost full. Also, don't leave the nozzle in the fuel tank, filling it up and walk away and leave it unattended. Don't jam it open and walk off and do something else. If you do happen to spill some fuel under the law, you have to report it to the Department of Transport. Not the police or your mum. The Department of Transport controls transport. Boats are transport, so you tell them about transport incidents. Also remember to keep the bilge of your boat clean. The bilge is the bottom of the inside of the boat, right down the bottom. If you have a bilge pump in the bottom of your boat, it's designed to pump water out. If it does pump water out, and there happens to be some fuel and oil also in your bilge, it'll pump the fuel and the oil out into the ocean or the river as well. And you'll be in big trouble. So keep your bilges clean. So far as general safety, when you're in a car, you don't dangle your arms or legs out the window. And the same applies on a boat. No one is allowed to dangle their arms or legs over the side of a boat when it is moving. Collision regulations are the traffic rules of the road for boats. They say who has right of way, who gives way, who does what. Of all the rules, the lookout rule is the most important. The skipper must keep a good lookout using eyes and ears at all times. Remember, it's the skipper's responsibility. Secondly, remember that every skipper has the responsibility to avoid collisions. Regardless of who should give way, who's in the right of way, colliding with somebody puts you in the wrong. All vessels must avoid collisions. End of story. Remember the rule we mentioned earlier that says that you must travel at a speed that will give you time to maneuver to avoid a collision. So no matter what somebody else does in their boat, you must be ready and must avoid a collision at all times. So if we're traveling in rain or in fog or at night, we should travel slower. Remember this. Keep an even better lookout. Make yourself visible by turning on your navigation lights and get ready to stop if needed. Travel slower. A very important part of boat driving is making sure that other skippers know what you are doing. They must know and be able to see what you're doing immediately. So when you turn, make it early, make it clear, make it large, make it very obvious what you are doing. So the other skippers understand what you are doing. Right of way and giving way. When two vessels are approaching a jetty from different directions, one going up the river, the other going down the river, which one has right of way? Let's work it out. Most boating rules can be worked out. Imagine you're rowing in your boat, rowing up river. You're struggling hard to fight against the current. You're rowing as hard as you can to go up the river to get to a jetty. Another boat is also headed to the same jetty. But they're coming down river. The current's helping them. They're taking it easy. They're cruising along. They're doing nothing. Just drifting along. Heading towards the same jetty at you as you are. Now, you're going very slowly and you're almost there. You're exhausted. Who should be the first person allowed to grab the jetty? You struggling up river? Or the others who are just sitting there cruising down river? The rule is the boat going up river, into the harbour, into the river, has right of way to pull into a jetty first. Power also gives way to sail, and that's another obvious one. The people who are sailing are generally having a more difficult time. A sailboat is not able to maneuver generally like a powerboat. The next bit is one of the most important things to learn and to know. You must know this saying off by heart. Look to the right. Keep to the right. Turn to the right. Give way to the right. This makes sense when you think about the early days of boating when these rules were invented. Early boats were all steered by oars that were hung over the right hand side of the boat. As the boats got bigger, the oars were replaced with larger boards, steer boards. 
steer boards. From there you get star boards, the right hand side of a boat. The person steering the boat using the steer board was on the starboard, the right hand side of the boat. When the boat got filled up with cargo, the person on the right who was steering with the steer board couldn't see the left of the boat, couldn't see the left of the channel, so the steer person could only see the right bank of the river. So they kept to the right, and people coming in the opposite direction in the river also kept to their right. And even though both steer persons on the steer board side of the boats couldn't see each other, they didn't hit each other as they were both on the steer board, the right hand side of the channel. People steering while on the right hand steer board side could see the right and could see straight ahead. So if they came to a huge large open lake or the ocean, some large area of water, and they could see somebody ahead of them or to the right of their boat, if they could see the other boat, they had to give way because obviously the other person wouldn't see them. If you can see, you can see that if two boats are on a collision course, the person who can see the other boat on his right has to give way because he's looking at the other boat's left hand side where there is no steer person. The steer person is on the right, so could not see, so it keeps on going. So the steer board now is hanging down quite deep on the right hand side of the boat and you can see it would get broken if it actually pulled into the riverbank to load or unload. So the opposite side of the boat was better to pull up to a jetty or a dock. A jetty or a dock or any unloading place is called a port. So the boat would sit against the port, against the jetty, with its left hand side facing the port and the steer board would be in the deeper water further out in the river away from the port on the right hand side. So there we have the port side of the boat against the port and the steerboard side out in the deeper water. History teaches us even more. We can learn the colours of lights on a boat. Imagine this boat now tied up with the port side tied up against the port, the jetty, in a harbour and the steerboard right hand side in the deeper water away from the jetty. The sailors are loading and unloading the boats day and night so it all depends on the tides and the Thames and uh, the Rhine and so forth. And so they had to load and unload in the dark. Remember, boats go 24 hours a day. Port is always awake. Day and night, life goes on. They soon learned that the sailors' night vision got destroyed when they carried bags off the jetty along the plank, going from the bright white lights in the port onto the dark ships, down into the hold, etc. So what they learned to do is put red lights on the jetty and in the harbour area. Red lights were in the port. Red lights in the harbour. That became the red light district, the harbour. Red lights are port. Red lights are where the sailors are. Then, carry this further, the boat leaves the port at night. Some of the red port lights are still hanging on its port hand side. Any other boat out in the water that can see the red lights knows that they are looking at the left hand side of a boat. Even in the pitch darkness, all you need to see is red and you know it's the left of another boat. You also know that when you're looking at the left hand side of another boat, there's no one there who's steering it. They're on the opposite side. They can't see you. So there you have port, red, on the left and steerboard on the right. It didn't take long for them to then add green for go on the right hand side of the boat. So if you're out there at night time and you see another boat's red light, you give way, you stop, or you turn to the right because you can only see to the right, you're on the steerboard side of the boat. You can't see to the left. So even when you're coming into a channel or into a harbour, if you see a red light, you go to the right of it. If you see a green light, you go to the left of that. And that applies whether you see another boat or a channel marker. It applies both ways. That set of rules really applies everywhere. And if you remember it, remember that picture, remember the image of what happens where, You'll understand port and starboard, red and green, give way to the right, keep to the right and turn to the right. When crossing, give way to the right. Whether you slow down or stop or just turn right to go around behind the other boat is your choice, but you must give way to the boat on your right. If you're headed towards another boat head on, both vessels must turn to the right. Remember to make the turn large, obvious and early. In plenty of time, so the other skipper is well aware of what you're doing. 
You can overtake on the left or the right when you're coming up behind another boat, but overtake only when it's safe and keep well away from the other vessel and be aware they may not have seen you, so they may turn suddenly. The overtaking boat, that's you, must keep clear of the other boat that is being overtaken. The boat being overtaken doesn't have to give way to you, you give way. This is one rule that overrides all the other give way rules, so you can't overtake a boat on its right and suddenly expect him to give way to the right. They don't have to give way to the right because you're overtaking them. The overtaking rule applies, so you must keep clear of them. So remember, look to the right, give way to the right, turn to the right, keep to the right, and give way when you're overtaking. This is a dive flag. A dive flag means there are divers nearby, so you should keep 50 meters away. If you absolutely have to go closer than 50 meters, then go at the slowest possible speed and keep a lookout in the water for divers. This is often near jetties and moorings when boats and divers are all in the same area. This boat has both the Australian Alpha dive flag as well as the red dive flag that you will see used in some overseas countries. Don't worry about the red one for now, just learn the Australian Alpha blue and white dive flag. At night, a dive boat must show its all-round white anchor light if it is anchored. Also, when diving, it must show red, white, red, which means restricted ability to maneuver. If, however, you're diving at night without a boat, then you need to have a yellow or an orange flashing light on display. Boats don't have visible turn indicators. They signal what they're going to do with sounds. A quick blast of the air horn lets others know how they're going to turn, as well as other things. We know the right hand side of the boat, the steerboard, starboard side, is the most important side of a boat. It's number one. So one blast of the horn means I'm going to turn right, starboard. Two blasts means the opposite, I'm going left. Three blasts means I'm going backwards. Five blasts of the horn officially means I am unsure of your intentions. What it actually means is, you aren't following the rules, I don't know what you're up to, get them out of my way. At night you'll see many different combinations of lights that boats can carry and commercial skippers need to know them all. But to get a recreational skipper's ticket you only need to know a few of the main ones. But first and most important, at night keep your speed down. Remember that. At night keep your speed down. Now, lights on boats. The most basic lights on power boats under 12 meters are the main ones that you need to know. Remember that no matter what lights you have, irrespective of how strong they are or whether they are on the left or the right or the top of the boat, the most important rule to remember about them is Lights mustn't be blocked, they mustn't be obscured. It is useless to have all the lights on, all in the right order, visible from the correct distance, the correct strength, the correct location, when any of them are blocked. To start with the most basic light is the single white all-round masthead light, and this is the one that is very often the most blocked one on boats. Check your boat out. Your all-round masthead light is also an anchor light, so if you are anchored you must have an all-round white light on and your light must be visible from all around. If not, somebody could drive into you from a particular direction because they don't see the light from that direction. At night, when we move on our boats, we must have our moving lights on. Moving lights are a red on port and a green light on the starboard side, at the sides, and a white light at the back, the stern. These lights tell other skippers what side of your boat they're looking at. The side lights on a moving boat are the same as the channel markers as you head into a river, or into a port, or into a harbour. They are red on the left and green on the right. You always have to have, at minimum, a red, a green, and a white light on when moving. 
The white light at the back is called a stern light and there are options for showing a white light behind you. You can either have a dedicated stern light at the back of the boat plus a masthead white light or an all-round white light. They both do the same thing. There are combination lights, there's a number of options so look them up. At night on a moving boat under 12 meters you should have side lights, a masthead and a stern light. Learn this, it's the most common set of lights that you will see at night and the ones you need to know. There are many places on the web you can see all these in 3D etc. plus also in the Skipper's Ticket workbook. If you saw this at night coming towards you, a green light and a red light and higher up and in between the two of them there's a white light. That would tell you a boat was headed straight at you so you would need to turn starboard. Remember, drive on the right, give way to the right and turn to the right. So we turn to the right, starboard, if we are head to head with another boat. Lateral markers. Lateral means the sides. So lateral markers are the marks that show us the sides of a channel. There is a port lateral marker and a starboard lateral marker. The port mark is square and red. Remember, there's a saying, there is red port left in the bottle when headed upstream. Red, port, left. The starboard mark is triangle shaped and green. A way to remember this is to remember star, starboard, star shaped triangle. Also green is good so it is good to keep to the right. It is good closer to the green when headed upstream into a port. So remember port is left and starboard is right. So on your way up a channel the port marker is on the left and the starboard is on your right. We keep to the good, we keep to the green, we keep to the right. Next we have to know this, the danger mark. Cannonballs are dangerous. So if you see a mark in the water that looks like two black cannonballs, that's a danger mark. They show an isolated danger. These show there is something dangerous at the mark. It could be a rock or a wreck, something small and dangerous like two black cannonballs. A safe water mark shows safe water obviously. And if you see one of these, you know safe water is all around the mark. A way to remember the safe water mark is visualize a safe striped circus tent with a red ball on top. So black cannonballs equals danger. Safe stripes with a red balloon on top, safe water. Then there are these special marks. Their purpose is a bit like the yellow witch's hats that you see on the road at temporary earthworks or roadworks. Special marks are yellow, often yellow X's. These yellow special marks are also usually temporary. They can also be used to separate traffic into lanes permanently. There are some of these at the Frio Fishing Boat Harbour entrance. They can mark off many things, rowing or sporting events, many things. Now we learn the north, south, west and east marks. These are called cardinal marks. Cardinal is another word for main or most important. And so far as compass directions, north, south, west and east are obviously the most important or cardinal markers. These four cardinal marks are positioned at the edges of a large dangerous area. So you must go to the north of the north mark you must stay south of the south mark, west of the west mark, and east of the east mark. If you know your compass directions north, south, west and east, then it's easy to learn. On the north cardinal mark, you'll see both cones are pointing up. North is up. On the south cardinal mark, you'll see both coins point down. The point is down. South. West and East are a little bit trickier. A W can be seen on its side on the West mark or some see that West has a waist. 
And an E can be made on the side of the east mark, or some say it looks like an egg, or it looks more like an egg than all of the others do anyway. So north is up, south is down, west has a waist, east is egg-shaped. At night, a white flashing light tells you what cardinal marker you're looking at. What can you see? The light flashes are quite easy to learn. They can be worked out by looking at your watch. Looking at your watch. Where is north, south, west and east on your watch? You'll see your watch numbers match up to north, south, west and east. So you'll see at night three flashes for east, six flashes for south, nine flashes for west and north is continuous. We don't know if it's 12 or 0 so it just keeps flashing. Six also has got a long flash after the six, just in case we lose count. So you'll see six, then a long one, and then six. So cardinal marks are compass directions, north, south, west, and east, and their lights match your watch. Anyone that goes up and down the Swan River at night will see the six quick flashes from the south cardinal marker on the sandbank of the Flying Squadron Yacht Club. Leads. Leads are basically two marks that you line up and when they are lined up you're on a transit. They're usually on land and usually one is on the water's edge closer to you and the other is higher up and further away. Some people conf get confused when talking about this about which is the front and which is the rear. Pick up a book. Hold the book in your hands. Look at it. The front of the book is the part of the book closest to you and the rear of the book is furthest from you. So the front lead is closest to you and the rear lead is furthest away from you. So if the front lead is at the water's edge, it's lower down, then the rear lead will be up higher and further away, maybe on top of a sand dune or up on a building. So if you steer to keep the rear lead above the front lead, it'll guide you along a channel. So just keep the rear lead above the front lead. Lead marker lights can be any colour and will be shown on the chart for the area. The reason why they are different uh, is because sometimes lights on the hill, house lights, road lights, car lights and so forth are around there. So therefore the lead lights need to be very different to the predominant lights in the area. Sectored lights aren't very common but they work in much the same way that common car traffic lights work by only letting people in front of them see the color of the light. Sectored lights shine a different colored light in a particular direction and when you aren't directly in front of it you won't see it. It's a narrow beam. Sectored lights can show you when you're to the left, to the right or in a channel. So you may see one color then you might move a little and you see another color. If you look at a chart you'll see which sectored light you're in. Each of them shines in a narrow area so one light shines there, one light shines here, one light may shine there. Sectored lights can show you dangers, a safe passage or shallow water. They don't just show you a channel. We need to know that most manufacturers recommend a service at least once a year. Batteries should always be secured properly so they can't move. And because they give off gas while charging, batteries should be located in a ventilated container. Batteries should also be topped up with distilled water. We should carry a spare set of spark plugs and a plug spanner if our motor has spark plugs. When the motor is running we need to make sure the water pump is working by looking to see if water is coming out the exhaust or if it's an outboard have a look at the telltale. Fuel problems are the cause of most breakdowns you should take precautions against all of the following. <clears throat> do not run out of fuel. Do not get dirt or water moisture in the fuel. And do not expose fuel to fire risks. Clean out your portable fuel tanks at least once a year. Before each and every trip, test the navigation lights. Check the bilge pump works. Check the bilges are clean and dry. Check the steering gear for stiffness.
Safety equipment must meet the required marine standard. It must be maintained in very good condition, accessible, that is easily reached, where it can easily be seen and ready to be used at all times. There's an excellent table in the new RST workbook. You need to know it. Have a look at it. As most boats stay in the river or stay close to shore, I'll go over these safety equipment items now. All vessels must carry a bailer or a bilge pump, no matter where they go. Remember that. All boats, bailer. A bailer is something like a bucket to scoop water out of the boat. Inboard motors have a risk of leaking fuel into the boat and igniting. So if you have an inboard motor, you must carry a fire extinguisher. Outboards don't need to carry a fire extinguisher. Remember, a fire extinguisher is in operational condition if the needle in the gauge is in the green. The date on the label does not tell you if it's operational. It's just a date. One second past midnight on the date it runs out will not stop it from working. So let's go back to the equipment we need. In the river or in protected waters, that's the only thing you need. One thing. You need a bilge pump or a bailer. In protected waters you don't need to anchor as you can drift to a bank. Whereas in unprotected waters there's no river bank on both sides of you so you need to carry an anchor. In unprotected waters, that is the, like the ocean, all boats need to carry an anchor whether they are 100 meters, 1 mile, 2 miles or 100 miles from the shore. Unprotected waters carry an anchor. Unprotected waters you need to do this plus you also need to carry a life jacket and flares as soon as you get to these unprotected waters like the ocean. Life jackets are often called personal flotation devices or PFDs. We're only interested today in PFD type 1 as the others are just for playing or doing sports in and are not really relevant to us for now. So only think PFD type 1 when talking safety equipment. We need one type 1 PFD for every person on the boat in unprotected waters. So let's review all of that again. In a river, one thing, bailer or bilge pump. If you have an inboard motor, fire extinguisher. In the ocean, let's say one nautical mile from the beach, we need bilge pump, anchor, PFD, inshore flares. Inshore flares when we are inside that area we spoke about earlier. Remember we mentioned inside five nautical miles. Also we need an EPIRP when we go over two nautical miles from the mainland or 400 meters from an island. Let's do that again. In a river, bailer only. Inshore, meaning the ocean, but close to the shore, we add inshore flares, anchor, and life jackets. Once you go a bit further, you go past two nautical miles, we add an EPO. So past two miles, you will have, in total, bilge pump, anchor, PFD, inshore flares, and an EPO. The next jump is past five miles. Past five nautical miles from the mainland, remember, past five, five nautical miles, a small boat is no longer visible from the shore. So we need to add a marine radio and offshore flares. Offshore flares include a parachute rocket flares. That's the reason you need rocket flares at a marine radio, so you can be seen a bit further out, beyond the horizon. Let's look at each item a bit more. Because we always anchor in sand, we need to know that the most common sand anchor is the Danforth. It's best in sand and it's easy to store flat. Remember that, Danforth. When using an anchor, always lower the anchor slowly while you move the boat backwards. Don't just chuck it over the side. Or you could end up with the anchor tangled up in its chain or rope. Chain and rope creates scope. Scope is the length of chain and the rope that is between the anchor and the boat as compared to the depth. So you need to put out five times the depth, remember five times the depth at the anchor if you have the usual three meters of chain attached to the anchor. So there's the depth, one, two, three, four, and five times as long as it is deep. Once the anchor is set, we need to check to see if it is dragging by taking a bearing or we line up some things, remember a transit, to see if we're moving. 
Now, PFD stands for Personal Flotation Device, i.e. life jackets. You need to carry a PFD-1 for each person on board in all unprotected waters. Check that the life jackets are suitable for the weight range of the person and check that it is a snug fit. Check the life jackets have no cuts and tears that could let water into the jacket and check the tabs are not frayed. The tabs are the bits that hold it together, the little plug-in gizmos. Though it's not law to actually wear the life jacket, it is law to carry them on a boat. However, it makes good sense to wear one in these four situations. One, bad weather, or when boating alone, or if you have small children, or if you're a poor swimmer. Flares. Let's look at flares again. <clears throat> Remember, you can't see a person on a small boat more than five nautical miles from the shore. So you will need parachute flares to be seen from the shore. More than five nautical miles from a shore, you need two parachute flares. Red handheld flares, handheld, remember, are mainly for night as they have a bright light, but they're only for closer. Orange smoke flares are designed for day use and are mostly visible from an aircraft, even on a windy day. You must not ever falsely set a flare off. It wastes people's time and valuable rescue resources could cause them not to be able to respond to a genuine emergency that may be happening. An EPIRB. You must carry an EPIRB if you go more than two nautical miles from the mainland or 400 nautical miles, meters, oh, sorry, 400 meters from an island. There are many different types of EPIRBs. We need to carry on a boat an approved 406 megahertz marine EPIRB that is in date i.e. its service date must be in date. If you need assistance, do not wait until it gets dark. If you need assistance, call for assistance immediately. Don't wait till everyone in all the other boats around you goes in. Send for a signal immediately. Waving, that's a signal. If you need assistance, first maybe try using the radio, flares or other methods before you use the EPIRP. EPIRP is the last resort. If you accidentally turn an EPIRB on, turn it off immediately and let AMSA know as soon as possible. There is a phone number on it you can call 1-800-641-792 or you just call on your marine radio, call your, la lake, la call your nearest marine radio station. While we're on radio, there is only one type of marine radio that needs the operator to hold a certificate of proficiency, that's a license. This is a VHF marine radio. The radio distress and calling channels are VHF channel 16 and 27.88 on a 27 meg. The 27 meg does not need a certificate of proficiency. A mobile phone cannot replace a marine radio because other boats in the area can't hear you calling on your mobile phone. Also, a mobile phone isn't easy to locate with the direction finding equipment and marine radio batteries also last a, last, last a lot longer than mobile phone batteries. We know that. A mayday call means a boat is in grave and imminent danger. Not that somebody's hurt their foot. A pan-pan is used for urgent safety of a vessel or a person, like a medical emergency, a man of a board, or a mechanical breakdown. You can then book your appointment with a Perth Boat School trainer and do your skipper's ticket on any day you want, at any boat ramp you want. It's that easy. Just book it online. When you book online, you'll also be sent a link to the practice theory quiz. And if you can pass that, you're sure to pass the real theory test on the day. You can do your theory and practical one after the other at the boat ramp or on the boat. If you study your theory from the workbook and this video, it should only take you about 15 minutes to pass the multiple choice questions, and you can then walk over to the boat and do the practical. Now, driving a boat with the proper training is easy. Our trainers will show you easy ways of remembering what to do and how to do it. There are just 11 tasks that the department requires you to do. The trainer will demonstrate each and every one of them, then you get to practice until you're getting it right, then you're assessed. It's more of a safety competence test than a boat handling test, so don't worry. It's more like getting L plates for a boat.